It's so numerous, so obvious, that he can scarcely deny them. It therefore does not require an unreasonable faith to recognize that the larger and less familiar patterns are under the control of the same principles. So the individual becoming attentive and contemplative of conduct, continuing his meditation upon his own way of life, can almost immediately, if he so desires, learn much about himself, learn much about the path that leads to union, lay many of the basic foundations for his future growth. And he must begin where he is. So he begins with the gradual conquest of illusion in these very patterns of law and cause and effect around him. Now there is one important point in yoga which begins even in karma yoga, which we would like to also emphasize. In the West, we think of evolution as a gradual growth of the creature through infinitudes of time from a present state to a superior condition. The Darwinian hypothesis more or less sustains this, and our study of the objective life of creatures carries the same general implication. So we think of growth as a gradual motion to be or toward eternity. And we also think that the ultimate state of man is something remote, something distant, something so far from him that he must contemplate it in terms of millions of years. This is based upon the assumption that his growth inwardly, his internal growth, is also upon the same tempo as his external evolutionary development as a physical creature. Yoga does not assume this. Yoga points out that as man is traveling a long road that leads from here to eternity, he should also bear in mind that this journey is his own journey and exists only because he believes it. He says the road is long and painful, therefore the road is long and painful. He says I must conquer one step at a time, therefore he conquers one step at a time. He says, I must release one quality at a time. It is going to be difficult to overcome this uh, tendency to sarcasm, this attitude of jealousy, this uh, instinct to hate. All of these things must be gradually worked out the long and hard way. And because these are the patterns which we set, they become the ways we must go. But if we think of it a little differently, what are we seeking? We are seeking identity with reality. Reality is not a matter of time and distance. Reality, as an outward condition of society, may be historically measured in aeons beyond our present state. But the reality which we may attain as beings a million years from now, or a hundred million years from now, that reality does not exist only at that time. That reality is here now. The reality which we are seeking to attain in some infinite future is here. Because without that reality we would not exist. Without that reality, there could be no rise of the sun, there could be no change of the seasons. Without that reality, we could not hope or dream for reality. Therefore, the infinite is not only infinitely distant, but infinitely immediate. The truth, which we hope to attain sometime, somewhere, is everywhere, always, if it was not everywhere always, it would not be eternal. And if it was not eternal, it would not be true. Therefore, as all things which have a real existence are eternal, they must be forever present, and not present only in a time, or at a place, or under a condition. Yoga, therefore, while it does not tell the individual that inevitably or unfailingly he can wake up tomorrow in eternity, does remind him that eternity 
is separated from his present state by an interval of consciousness. And that this interval of consciousness is not under the dominion of time. That this interval of consciousness is under the laws of its own existence and not under the laws of the progression of the equinoxes or the alternation of seasons. Therefore, that everything that is real is timeless. And that man's concept of time is the measure of an interval of quality within himself. It is man's effort to measure that which man cannot even comprehend, understand, or hope uh, to validly estimate. Therefore, in the problem of yoga, the individual must make a, a positive or major change in certain values. But yoga tells him very frankly that if he goes along by the law of karma yoga, if he is punished and rewarded, helped and hindered by his own conduct, on and on and on, if he lives with himself long enough, he will get over himself. Now that may require a hundred million years because some people are awfully fond of themselves. It may require an immense cycle of pain, pleasure, hope, despair. It may mean that he has to move with the enormous motion of life itself, learning through trial and error. Learning to cling to the real by the perpetual failure of the unreal. Coming finally to love the true by being disappointed countless times when he devoted his affections to the untrue. Ultimately, however, karma yoga must lead him as the inevitable consequence and chemical reaction of cause and consequence must lead him ultimately toward the, uh, the goal of emancipation. Therefore, everything that happens to us contributes gradually to the upbuilding of the power of release. But this may be an exceedingly long, difficult, problem-ridden journey. A journey which in the Eastern way of life is measured not in years but in lives, hundreds of lives lived by the individual seeking to find the one life that is forever here. This also plays a very important part in Buddhism. And it is very important to consider in connection with karma in order that we may not fall into the pit that Aristotle was so quick to deserve in certain of Plato's doctrine, namely what he calls the doctrine of regressive evasion. In other words, why does it happen now? Because of something that happened yesterday. Why did it happen yesterday? Because of something that happened the day before. And so on to infinity. We never arrive at first cause. On the opposite end, tomorrow is the result of today. Uh, the day after tomorrow, the result of tomorrow. The day after that, the result of the preceding day. And so on and on, and we never come to an ultimate. Aristotle pointed that out as leading inevitably to a vicious circle. In other words, these causes and effects go on forever, and man exists only in a squirrel cage, in which he can never escape unless there is some other dimension or some other factor involved in the operation of these laws. Now, the thing that is that, the, that is added, uh, the, the difference by which the cycle is established rather than the circle, lies in another factor, another dimension of this important problem. Namely, that not only is man experiencing, but man is meditating. Man is contemplating internally the overtones of value involved. Therefore, everything that happens to him not only brings its mechanistic effect, but its philosophical overtones. Man is not only passing through an incident, he is changing consciousness as a result of the incident. Now, if this changing of consciousness is by trial and error alone, then, again, we have the long and difficult path. But if this change of consciousness is under discipline, 
then the individual begins to affect his own action. He begins to step into the problem of activity in a new relationship to it. Now, to come to the yoga angle of the thing, however, we have a little different point of view that has to be taken into consideration. Yoga as a recognition of a certain impersonal, inevitable divinity reminds us that nothing can happen to us unless there is something for it to happen to. If the individual stands on a certain street corner in the midst of traffic, he is very apt to have close shaves or finally be injured. If he is not there, he cannot be injured. Karma and these laws of cause and effect which we interpret on a moral and ethical level as pain and pleasure, reward and punishment, good and evil, only operate because of our own position in relation to the universe. They have no operation as far as we are concerned except in relation to the focal point with which we are concerned. There is no karma unless it happens to us. Now this is a rather subtle point. <laughs> but it is exactly the problem that there would be no danger of being shot if you weren't there. But if you are there, it's a very good danger of being shot if the bullet is aimed at you. Karma, in order to operate, must operate against certain fixed illusions within the consciousness of the being. Effective. Karma can only operate where the individual is under a certain cycle of activities of a moral nature in which he is capable of right and wrong decision and in which he is sensitive to the reactions of joy and sorrow, hope and fear, life and death. <coughs> now, a good example of the problem of yoga is the problem of death itself. And in all systems of mysticism and esotericism, death and illumination have always been intimately associated in symbolism. The transition from this world to the next has been used to represent the transition of man from one state of existence in consciousness to another. Now we come to a very simple problem. Do we die? The materialist says, yes, death is possible. Now is the fact thus established, or does the materialist die because he accepts the fact? Now don't think for a moment that we're going into a sphere of affirmations because that isn't where we want to get to. Do we, as thoughtful ideals, believe that we die? Do we believe that death is the end of anything or is merely a transition from one condition of existence to another? <coughs> Yet something can die. The reason why it can die is because it was born. If there is something within us which cannot die, the reason why it cannot die is because it was never born. Was itself eternal. And that what, what we call birth and death are motions on the level of form in which that which is unborn and undying manifests objectively and then passes into a subjective state. But the life itself, even our own life, is undying. The thing that dies is John Smith or Mary Jones, the body which we live. Yet that which is within the body cannot die, and cannot be destroyed by another creature, or cannot be devastated by war or plague. It is in itself and inevitable, unchangeable and real. Now let us shift this thinking to the level of cause and effect on a moral plane. 
The individual says, I can be cheated. Can he? In terms of Eastern philosophy, no. He cannot be cheated. The only way he can be cheated is by the supreme fact that he can cheat himself by believing that he can be cheated. And that is where the cheating takes place. That wherever these things happen, it is because in his own state of ignorance, he is accepting a level corresponding to the body which is born and dies, and is without realization or experience of the eternal life that cannot be born and cannot die. Now this eternal life which is within man and is the reality of him, is therefore like the reality of his spiritual integrity, something that cannot be touched by the vicissitudes of existence. Yet while man lives objectively, he can be safe. As long as he lives objectively, he can be rich or poor. As long as his consciousness is focused upon body, he is a victim of everything that happens to body. As long as he believes that he and his body are identical, he can fail, he can pass through every change, every alteration, every mood to which body as a visible and objective form can be subjected. As body, he can be monitored. As consciousness, he cannot. As body, he can be defeated. As consciousness, he cannot. As, he, as a person, he can be destroyed. As a universal life, he is indestructible. So his ability to react to laws upon various planes depends entirely upon the focal point of his own consciousness. If he is focused in his bank account, the loss of it is a supreme tragedy. If he is not focused there, it comes and goes and is very little concern to him. Some individuals find it difficult to accumulate, others find it difficult to spend what they have accumulated. There are innumerable intemperances and only one temperance. There are countless illusions and only one reality. Now the law of calm relates to a conditioned existence in which the individual by his own causations has set upon himself consequences that he must face. He must face them as long as he was foolish enough to cause them. And he must face them as long as he is operating on a level of consciousness in which his own conscience, his own morality, tells him that he has broken faith with himself. If then we are dealing with the problem of yoga, we are dealing with the realization <coughs> that the individual moving from one level of consciousness to another, by so doing, moves the center of his own awareness, moving, as the Buddhist explains the same problem, from servitude to one interpretation of law to emancipation under another interpretation of the same law. Because the law of the universe is in itself not comic. It is only comic when this law comes into conflict with the sattva or the self-focus of an individual who is unenlightened. This will require more thought and more time, but we will give it that thought and time in the course of the series of talks that we are dealing with now. But in your problem of karma, in both your Buddhist and your Hindu system, you have, therefore, something that is very difficult for the Westerner to understand, and that is an absolute law that apparently can be transcended by a discipline. It isn't transcended by the discipline. The law and its reaction are both interpretations by the consciousness of the human being upon a level. When he is no longer on that level, 
That interpretation of those, that whole cycle of circumstance fades out like the insubstantial fabric of a dream, leaving not a rack behind. The problem then is to recognize the, the essential and inevitable transitions of these patterns. To the mystic, uh, to the Eastern yoga, a yogi in meditation, the universe is a sudden expansion of universals in which things like cause and effect have returned or absorbed again into their own eternal source. They are like time. They exist for those creatures who exist within time because they do not know that they are timeless. There's the Hindu fable about the elephant, <coughs> which is tied by a small cord to a stake. The elephant remains there year after year because it doesn't know that with one good hard pull, the stake and the rope would go. But because the elephant is a cautious and conservative creature like man, it moves its foot a little, finds a little resistance, and decides that it is there uh, bound securely. It has not realized that this bondage is meaningless in terms of the potential strength of the creature itself. In then the consideration of karma, how are we going to solve the problem? Karma is cause and effect. Cause and effect are action and reaction. What is cause? Cause is always an aggressive activity of some kind. What is an effect? It is the receptivity to the consequences of an aggressive activity. Therefore, the more aggressive the activity, the more dynamic the circumstances which it causes. Uh, the more dynamic these circumstances, the more dynamic the reactions which will inevitably follow them. Therefore, if we strike the man, we may expect that he will strike us back. If we perform a certain action with excess, we may expect the reasonable consequences, which will be the reaction of excess. So we begin the contemplation of what is the solution. How do we begin to extricate ourselves from excess? Now what is excess in the majority of instances? Why are we excessive creatures? We are excessive because of self-will, because of certain personal purposes with which we are primarily concerned, and upon the dynamic that this internal self-will is a real and valid source of authority. I want, and that in itself is enough. From that point on, there is only one thing that remains, and that is to get what we want. The fact that we desire is all the authority we need to devote a lifetime to the effort to secure that which we desire. The merit of the desire is never considered. The essential integrity of the thing which desires and its essential nature and its relationship to eternals is not known. Therefore, because this desire arises from some obscure and mysterious part of our own internal, we assume that it is the voice of authority that we must live and should live in order to justify that desire. So we live largely to justify desire, to fulfill ambition, and to achieve such creature comforts as may most uh, likely be conducted, uh, conducive to pleasure and happiness. Yet at the end we find not pleasure and happiness, but infirmity and death. That is a disaster. That is the part that is difficult. If, however, changing this point of view, we say that a thing is not necessary because we wish it, but that the wise man says we wish that which is necessary. The change of our perspective, the change of our relation towards desire, <coughs> releases us from what the Buddhist calls the, one of the principal hindrances. These hindrances represent the attitudes which are traditional to us, which are the principal cause of our troubles, attitudes which are not real, 
not natural, not essential, that have been cultivated by our way of life until we accept them as part of our heritage. If then we begin the contemplation of these principles, let's just survey this contemplation briefly. We can't go into all of it, it's a very large subject, but let's see what would happen if we begin to think some of these things through just a little. We are in a spot, let us say, at the present time. There are difficulties surrounding us. We are in debt, let's say. Uh, there is a little danger that they may come and collect the icebox, the car, the television, and several other things, and that also we must remember with some grievances that the suit we're wearing is not paid for. <laughs> and of course, there's nothing more that is undesirable than to pay for a one-out suit. <laughs> that is what many people do. Now, there are several ways in which we can look at this. Here we are, we are beyond their depth. Our first and natural thought is to go socialistic in this emergency and begin a wholesale damnation of the credit system. <laughs> in other words, the advertisers, the merchants, the manufacturers, and everyone else concerned in this problem is responsible for our misfortune. Why? Because they have made it very easy for us to be very foolish. Therefore, the great problem is what society has done to us. And it is so nice to think of it. But it is exactly the same thing as to say that our friends have wronged us, our relatives have deceived us, and all these things. They all belong under the same general headings. Except in the case of the man who is over his head and dead, uh, the real circumstances are perhaps a little more obvious to him than in some of the other relationships of life. Now here he is in his predicament. He may blame others, blame the universe. He may take faith in the thought that there is no God, that there is no justice, that the universe is a tyranny, that his friends and associates are all living only to get what they can off of him. He can go into all kinds of attitudes out of this and justify himself in every way that he wants to. And he's still in debt, he still can't pay it. Or he may by some chance gain a small amount of wealth from some source or other or make a successful loan, which he will consider good fortune, not having any relation to law, but merely to uh, perhaps his own persuasive personality. You see, he's solving this himself now. As a result of that, he's able to pay off these bills. And having discovered that such things are possible, he will now immediately contract a whole new series of them <laughs> and do exactly the same thing that he did before. And he will not observe that the fact that he can't sleep at night, the fact that his friends have difficulty with him, that he is no longer able to do his work well, that his family finds him irritable and unpleasant, and that he generally is uncomfortable. He does not necessarily blame himself for any of these things. They are the results of bad luck. They are the results of the fact that other people didn't understand him. And so the whole message of law to him was lost. The simple fact of the matter is that he was fooled. He was just unwise. He was unreasonable. He did things which his own common sense should have told him he shouldn't do, but he did them because he wanted to. Now this is the basis of karma to a very large degree. Here we have that for the individual today with any one of innumerable problems presented and which death may be won. Either he rationalizes himself out of the lesson, or else he rationalizes himself into the lesson. He either blames others or himself. And the first step in the situation is to blame himself. That is the first constructive attitude. It's to stop blaming the world and recognize that he himself is to blame. Now that is a beautiful thought in its own nature. It may or may not lead, however, to any constructive act action. He may simply say, I'm sorry, I was foolish, too bad, and then tomorrow repeat. He may still blame himself without learning. But if he repeats several times, he will probably gain a certain instinct toward moderation. He will not do it again repeatedly. He may do it several times, but not forever. Ultimately, he must learn something. But assuming that he accepts the responsibility as his own, he has set this thing in motion. 
He got himself into a situation which may take him several years of painful self-sacrifice to clear up. Now comes the next question, which is infinitely more important and which the recovery will not ask unless under some special uh, dispensation of intelligence. And that is, what is this self that he is blaming? Now then, it isn't somebody else's fault, he says, now it's my own fault. I am responsible. Now what is the I that is responsible and made him do a foolish thing? You know, this I is of a quality and of a dispensation that can run him in debt in three weeks. If this I can also cause him to do many wrong things, and it does, and he knows it, why is he so eager to forever please this I? And why is he willing to hang his whole destiny upon it? The thing that this I makes him do is stupid. And yet, as a being, he has accepted the infallibility of this I and built his whole philosophy of existence upon it. If wherever it operates, it does things that are not very wise. It is this I which makes him ambitious, makes him sacrifice health to fortune, makes him sacrifice honor to profit. And yet he loves this I, he serves it, adores it, and considers it to be little less than divine. And it is all that's getting him into trouble. <coughs> What about this I? The least you can say about it is that it needs educating. <laughs> now how are you going to educate this I? Can you educate it by sending it to school and teaching it the liberal arts and sciences? No. Because the people who have had that education are making just as many mistakes as those who have not had it. There are individuals who have many degrees after their names who are in debt for their Xboxes. It hasn't solved it. <laughs> Why? Because in educating the eye, you're educating something on a quality level that cannot be educated by ordinary schooling. The only thing that you can do with this eye is reach it on a level of intelligence, on a level of basic thinking. The only thing, however, takes a very simple attitude. This eye isn't worth saving. Because no matter what you do with it, no matter how much you condition it, no matter how much you perfect it, it is still a dead loss. It will always be a dead loss. And the final fact of it being a dead loss is that as long as that I is there, the great and eternal I of eternal being can never be known. Because there cannot be two eyes in the universe. There is only one. There is one reality. And all the rest is in some way deficient. Therefore, it is this reality which is more important, more significant, more real than I. The mind and the self are both slayers of reality. So in the problem of yoga, the answer to karma lies in the simple fact that the eye causes it. And therefore, the cessation of the eye must be the end of it. As long as there is self-will, there is reaction. And there is universal will, there is no reaction. Because this universal will, being in itself eternal, inevitable, and absolute, in its good, being complete and perfect and efficient in none of its parts, the only reaction that can come from its own conduct is perfection, is reality. That which makes no mistakes can have no reaction except absolute good. Consequently, for the standpoint of yoga, the eternal is the only unconditioned being and the state of eternal consciousness is the only condition of consciousness which can have no reaction. Nothing can be caused by it except itself. Nothing can result from it except itself. Therefore, that which is complete and whole cannot give birth out of itself to incompleteness or separateness. 
separateness, self-existence, and all of these dependencies are the source of karma. And karma cannot exist apart from separateness. It cannot exist in a state of absolute unity. In the study, then, of the problem of karma, the primary lesson is negative, but very important. Namely, that the individual begins to contemplate the relationship between the suffering and the cause of suffering, and comes through the study of karma to the final discovery as an experience of consciousness, not something I tell you, but something that you experience within yourself, that it is yourself which makes it possible for you to suffer. That it is not the God in you that causes pain, but the you in you. And that as long as that you in you has an existence apart from the divine existence, you can suffer. And as long as self-will in any way varies from universal will, you will suffer. Therefore, in the West, the problem was to discover the universal will and keep it. That was the platonic concept. That if we know all things, we can now obey absolutely. And by so doing, achieve peace of soul. In the East, it is not conceived possible that the I can never, that the I can ever know the all. Because the fragment can never contain the entire. The fish can never swallow the ocean in which it swims. And so, attempting to conquer the infinite is a fish trying to swallow its own ocean. That which is infinite is infinitely greater than I. Therefore, the I cannot contain it, cannot control it, cannot dominate it, and can never willfully demand anything of it. When man demands of the infinite, he receives only, by interpretation, that which the I itself creates through this chemistry. In the East, consequently, the concept is the gradual diminution of the I, so that the self is no longer the controlling fact. Now, the individual says, what kind of a future does that give us? What kind of a future is there for the individual if his own I does not go on? We might ask, what kind of a future is there for him if it does? Because actually, this race and this world has been a long time here, and we are the future which the past looked forward to. And here we are, with all our lore, like all the talked about, the very fools no wiser than before. We have probably been about a million years working up to our present state of compounded stupidity. We are the glorious achievement of i -ness. And we can hardly stand it. <laughs> so we go on. Theoretically, we go on long enough, and just industriously enough, we may grow ourselves into another office. <laughs> what has we gained? What is the solution? Have we found peace? Are we any happier than the aborigine? Actually. We have found new pleasures, but we have paid for each of them with a new pain. Where has the eye brought us? The eye has brought us only to a state of unmitigated egotism, a continuing optimism concerning our own capacity to do things that we have hardly the inclination to do, and no proof that we will increase in inclination. The East says we'll never make it that way, because we cannot break through the tyranny of selfhood on the level of a material, educational, or moral, or even theological program. The self remains, and as long as the self remains, the individual is the victim of it. But supposing the self does not remain, supposing we achieve the Eastern meditation, which is man's transition of becoming 
respective to the motion of infinite through himself. What then is his condition? Suppose that the eye ceases and that the individual is returned again to universal consciousness itself. What is his state? In the first place, we don't know. And the only experience that we know of it and can have of it is the experience that is gained and is relative in the higher examples of Raja Yoga. What is this extraordinary diffusion of consciousness that takes place in the Eastern mystic under the higher disciplines of advanced yoga? He feels himself moving inevitably and eternally toward an identity. An identity is an existence which is unconditioned. He finds himself moving towards the complete suspension of his own existence. He does not report to us a terrifying descent into vacuum. He does not experience within his own consciousness the wrench of separation from existence, as he has previously known it. All mystics, whether of the Greek or the Eastern schools, have one common report to tell us, namely that the experience is that of the individual going home. That uh, it is, as Plotinus called it, the motion of the alone to the alone. That it is the final recognition, the final fulfillment of something that transcends anything that the individual has ever experienced. That it is not for him elimination of existence, it is not that he goes to sleep and never wakes. It is nothing that he knows, because it is a condition of experience which transcends that which is known. He cannot say that he enters into a state of non-existence. He could not enter into a state of non-existence if that with which he is associated is all existence. He moves from a fragmentary position to a participation in the experience of totality. He moves from oneness to allness, and he simply has no faculties with which to interpret that experience. But allness as totality is incapable of conflict. Con lack of conflict causes incapacity for karma, because there can be no differences. There can be no inconsistencies. There can be nothing of this kind experienced by this being. Now, in the advanced yoga, as in other mystical systems, these conditions are not continuous. Uh, the Vedantist passes into his samadhi. He remains for a time in a state of uh, what we would term ecstasis. He then returns again to the material world and continues to exist in it. What is the effect upon him? Is the Western psychologist justified in assuming that this individual has now moved into an extraordinary negation which will frustrate all progress. What is progress? Is not progress itself the motion of an illusion toward a reality in some way? Is the achievement of the reality a frustration of progress or a consummation of it? Has the mystic in his meditation simply anticipated the motion of his world by a few hundred million years, or has he actually broken faith with his world and become something impractical, uh, visionary, a creature no longer contributing to the progress of his society. I think the record that we have in connection with the Eastern mystic justifies us in assuming the same thing that we find recorded of the Meeks, Swedenborg, and other Western mystics. Namely, that the primary change brought by the Samaritan condition is a reorganization of values within the individual. The change of polarity as to that which is true or important or unimportant. And that consequently, 
the illumined mystic lives from a universal totality within himself, by means of which, therefore, he is in a position and a condition to direct his outer affairs, not by his personal desires, but by the experience of universal law moving through him. This would seem to me also would give us the answer to the karmic question and show us why karma, uh, through its workings and its operations, gradually reveals to us the great fallacy, which is the fallacy of causation upon the level of ego. And that as a result of that, karma yoga is the meditation upon this, the gradual realization that the only cause which cannot have a destructive effect is that which arises from universal totality within ourselves. Therefore, that the only end of pain is identification with reality. That everything else must have some negative consequence. But that this identification, being itself a cause, when it is a pain, causes itself and causes the continuance of itself. So that cause and effect still operates in a mysterious manner. But illumination causes the identity to continue. The effect of reality is itself. Whereas the effect of everything unreal must be less than itself. In these contemplations and meditations, therefore, we have the beginnings of discipline. The individual is disciplined by his incentives to grow and to proceed and to advance along these fields of thought and speculation. And uh, this is a groundwork of yoga because it contains a great many of the basic principles upon which the other branches with which we are more than familiar uh, depend. For the entire process of the individual gradually achieving non-self-consciousness is the process of moving away from the hopelessness of a vicious circle in which he has locked himself by his own ignorance. This vicious circle may at some time appear attractive, but ultimately it must appear in his true light, namely insufficient. Not enough to fulfill the inevitable longing of the human consciousness for re-identification with his own divine source. So yoga becomes the study of this union and the various methods by means of which it can be attained. And the following uh, lectures of this series will be devoted to unfolding the various rules of yoga with which uh, you will find note on the program. And we thank you for being with us tonight.